Welcome to sections 13.2 and 13.3. All right, gentle people, in the last lecture, what we covered was ionic bonds, and we revisited this topic. And just to remind you, ionic bonds are made out of two ions coming together, a cation and an anion. Now, this can involve polyatomic ions coming together with an ion, but a very good indicator for an ionic bond is a metal bound to a non-metal. Now, if you will recall, we talked about another type of molecule, and that molecule was put together using covalent bond. You identified these when you saw two non-metals coming together. Now, a covalent bond means that two elements are sharing electrons together. So here are examples of things that are forming covalent bonds. Hydrogen with hydrogen, chlorine with chlorine, and oxygen with oxygen. So let's go ahead and explore how this interaction works. So to help us understand this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take two hydrogen atoms. Let's call this hydrogen atom A and hydrogen atom B. Now remember what a hydrogen atom is made out of. There's a proton in the center, and then the electron is around that proton. So let's start out with these two hydrogen atoms infinitely far apart. If that's the case, let's go ahead and say that the energy of our system is zero. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring these two atoms closer and closer together. Now what's going to happen is that the electron from hydrogen A is gonna see the proton in hydrogen B. And the opposite is true the electron from hydrogen B is going to see the proton in hydrogen A. Now remember, an electron seeing a proton is a favorable interaction. A positive and a negative want to be close together. And so what happens is I get a lowering of energy of my system because now, now each electron can see two protons and each proton can see two electrons. And so as I bring them closer and closer together, these new interactions become stronger and stronger, and I lower the energy of my system. Now remember, nature always wants to lower the energy of the system. So this interaction is a favorable interaction, and it's better for these two atoms to be together than they are apart. However, there's a limit to how close I can bring these two things together. What you guys will see as I, as I bring them closer and closer together, you can start to see that I start to raise the energy of our system. And this is because that if I bring these atoms too close to each other, the proton from A will start to see the proton from B. And I don't want to have two positive charges seeing each other. And so there's an optimal distance that I can bring these two atoms together. And that is when I maximize the electron from one atom seeing the proton of the other atom and minimizing the two protons seeing each other. This turns out to be the bond length or the distance between the two nucleuses. So what you should take away from this is that if we start to share electrons, I can go ahead and lower the energy of my system. And that's going to be the rise of the covalent bond, where I have a sharing of electrons to lower the energy of our system. And this is a common occurrence when I bring two nonmetals together. Now, if we look at these molecules that I've underlined, you'll notice that I'm using the same atom coming together. These are homonuclear molecules, meaning that there's only one atom forming these molecules. However, we can go ahead and bring different atoms together, but there are consequences when we do this. One of the characteristics that arise when you have two different atoms together is the possibility that the bond becomes a polar bond. So what you guys will see is if I form this molecule HCl, these two different atoms come together and share electrons. If I were to go ahead and pump HCl gas in between two charged plates, so one plate has a negative charge and one plate has a positive charge, 
what I would see is the molecules would align along those plates. What I would see is that the hydrogen would be pointed towards the negative plate. And the chlorine part of the molecule, well, that would be pointed towards the positive plate. What this is showing is that this HCl molecule is acting like a bar magnet. And we've discussed this concept before in a previous lecture. What's happening here is that the electrons are not being shared equally. In this case, chlorine is being a greedy atom. And so what it's doing is it's pulling all the electrons towards it, even the one that is shared by hydrogen. Now, it's not completely ripping the electron away from hydrogen. It's just trying to pull it closer to itself when hydrogen is trying to share its electron. So what I can draw is what's called a dipole arrow. In chemistry, when we draw a dipole arrow, we draw an arrow towards the more greedier atom. In addition, on the tail of this arrow, we're going to make it a little cross. What this signifies is the positive and negative end. Because the chlorine is greedier and pulling the electrons towards it, it adopts a slightly negative charge. So we're going to use the small delta symbol and a minus to denote a partial negative charge. Now this isn't a full negative charge like if the electron were removed from the hydrogen and placed on the chlorine. It is only a partial charge because the chlorine is just drawing the electrons closer to it. On the other end of the molecule, we're going to have a partial positive charge. That's because the hydrogen doesn't get to experience that electron on it in the full degree. If I have a net dipole, we consider the molecule polar, and it behaves like a little bar magnet. You'll note the dipole arrow, because of its cross, the cross can look like a plus sign telling you which is the positive end of that bond. The arrow tells you the negative end of that bond. Now, one of the questions that you might ask is how do we know which atoms are greedier than the other atoms? And this has to do with a characteristic called electronegativity. Electronegativity is the ability for an atom to draw electrons towards it when it is part of a compound, meaning it is in a bond. Now, I want you guys to be careful. This is different from electron affinity. Electron affinity means I'm putting an electron onto an atom. Electronegativity has to do with how the atom acts when it is bonded to something else. We can get the relative electronegativity of atoms by doing experiments. And what you guys see here are the values of those electronegativity. Now, there is a trend on our periodic table. What you guys will see is that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. As you go down from fluorine, you become less electronegative. And as you go from right to left away from fluorine, you become less electronegative. Now, we can calculate the difference in electronegativity. So that's going to be delta electronegativity. Go ahead and look up the values of each one of your atoms. So in this case, we have chlorine at 3 and hydrogen at 2.1. So the difference in electronegativity is 0.9. In general, when you put compounds together, if the electronegativity is, is really great, i.e. greater than 1.8, this is probably going to form an ionic bond. If it's between 0.4 and 1.8, these are considered polar covalent. And if it's less than 0.4, we would say it's mostly covalent, meaning it has a very low polarity. If it is zero, then this means it's a nonpolar molecule. So if we look at this calculation, HCl is considered a polar covalent bond. All right, gentle people, why don't you go ahead and take a look at this quiz question and give me an answer. You guys can use the electronegativity values on the previous slide to help you make this assessment. All right, looking up the values, 
we have chlorine at 3.0 minus 0 0.9 for NaCl, we get 2.1. You guys can say that NaCl is an ionic compound, and this electronegativity difference corresponds to what we would previously have assessed NaCl as. LiH, 2.1 minus 1.0. 1.1 is our resultant electronegativity difference. For HF, we have 4.0 minus 2.1. This gets us to 1.9. And finally, rubidium oxide, 3.5 minus 0.8, which gives us a value of 2.7. So because the last one has the highest electronegativity difference, it is considered the most ionic compound. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1A, and remember to stay safe.